Okay then, let's get to it. Welcome to our fourth video in 334. This video has three parts. First, I want to briefly take a step back, kind of lay out where we are in the course, where we're going, and how the different kind of major pieces are going to fit together as we move forward. Uh, second, as we move into kind of, we, we've talked about relational model, about SQL, and we're moving into kind of uh, the, the more computer systems part of, of and, and starting at a low level of, of a database system. And so because folks are uh, in this class kind of with all uh, having taken different classes, different, different background, uh, I wanted to take some time to sort of just lay out some fundamentals of computer systems, some terminology that um, I don't want to be a mystery as, as we move forward. And uh, some or, or most of this may be a review for some of you. So feel free to, to skim the posted notes and, and uh, skip this part if, if it all looks familiar. And uh, the third part is actually going to be uh, a lecture from Andy Pavlo on uh, buffer pool managers, which is uh, the component of a database system that you'll be implementing in project one. And there'll be a link to that lecture and more information about kind of the relevant part uh, in the video description. All right, so let's get started. Here we go. All right, so the kind of broad outline for the course, we have the relational model and the, the SQL query language that we use with that. Check mark. Got that squared away. Uh, and now we're going to move into talking about the storage. How is uh, the information for a database system uh, actually kind of stored and, and managed at the, at the low level? Uh, the kind of next major component uh, is going to be execution. Uh, and this is kind of at kind of many, as, well, as I'll lay out in a moment, kind of many different layers for how uh, database systems actually kind of run and, and, and execute queries and, and uh, over data in efficient ways. And we'll finish up with topics on concurrency control and recovery. So concurrency control, uh, how do we keep uh, a database system that has lots of different transactions and operations going on uh, uh, simultaneously? How do we keep that uh, uh, consistent and, and, and organized? And then recovery, what happens if uh, things crash, things go terribly wrong? Uh, we don't want to lose all of our data. Okay, so these kind of components of our course outline relate to of the, the components uh, of a database system that, uh, that, kind of, uh, that, that we'll be talking about. So uh, this list, we're going through it from top to bottom, and, but we're actually going to uh, build, uh, now I'm going to kind of write up the components of a database system that we're sort of going to build up from the bottom up. So uh, at the bottom, we have a disk manager uh, and uh, this uh, is kind of what's actually managing the, the files that uh, uh, the, the data is, is stored in. And above that, we have a uh, buffer pool manager, which is uh, kind of coordinating with the disk for, for, to get the data that the, uh, that the database needs. Uh, and this buffer pool manager is our project one. This is the, the component you'll be implementing. And this is what uh, part of today's video is about. And uh, next, uh, next time we'll kind of circle back and talk about this disk piece. But I wanted to, to get to the buffer pool manager first since uh, we have a project uh, coming up for that. Uh, so these two components are kind of part of uh, the storage piece of this outline. Next, uh, we have kind of how data is uh, uh, arranged and, and structured for efficient access. Uh, so this is an access methods piece. And uh, this will be our uh, project two. You'll be implementing a, a very widely used data structure called a B plus tree uh, in the, the bus tub system. And kind of above our access methods, we have um, operator execution. 
And so we've talked about SQL operators such as joins, such as sorting, such as aggregations. And there's a part of a database system that actually executes these different operators on our data and produces the appropriate result. And this will be our final uh, project three. And uh, above this, something that we won't, uh, won't have a project on, but we will uh, spend, definitely spend some time looking at a uh, really interesting uh, topic is query planning, kind of when you get a SQL query, uh, as we've talked about, it doesn't tell you that the step-by-step -step, um, actions to take, that's kind of up to the database system to develop uh, a plan. And so kind of these three pieces here, access methods, operator execution, query planning, kind of part of this execution piece, how uh, it, our operations actually executed, and then the last two pieces, concurrency control and recovery, sort of permeate all of this in terms of uh, uh, controlling concurrent uh, access and, and our, our overview of uh, kind of computer systems fundamentals will get into what concurrency is and why we care about it. So if, if this is a, a new term to you, uh, the, I hope the, the, the mystery will be, uh, will be resolved soon. Uh, but for concurrency control and, and, and recovery, it's going to involve uh, kind of pieces throughout, throughout this, this stack. So this is uh, the outline of, of where we are and where we're headed. All right, so now I want to move on to kind of fundamentals of computer systems and to start at, uh, and just, just to start at the very bottom, uh, in computer hardware, data is represented as binary bits, right? We, uh, uh, a bit is a zero or one, and this is kind of the fundamental unit of, of data storage, of, of representing information in digital computer systems. And these uh, bits are grouped into uh, bytes, which are eight-bit chunks. And naturally, uh, we have something called a nibble, which is four bits, a bit of uh, computer science uh, jokes for you there. Um, and memory uh, in a computer, we are going to view as just a large array uh, of bytes. And kind of, so, so memory is, is a large array, a bunch of uh, individual cells, uh, each of which is, is a byte. And uh, each of these bytes have a unique memory address or a unique numerical index that we can use to refer to that byte. Uh, and you may have heard me say before, a memory address is the same thing as a pointer. So when we have a pointer in C, C, or C++, what we actually have is just this numer unique numerical index that refers to a particular byte in memory, and then when we want to refer to uh, to some uh, data or, or structure or object that we're storing, uh, we, we have a pointer to it, we have its address in memory, the, the location in this big array of bytes where it is stored. And uh, different kinds of data uh, will be, will take up different numbers of bytes. So in, uh, in C, if we have an int, that's going to be four bytes. If we have a double, that's going to be eight bytes. And so when we have the memory address of something, that will be uh, the address of the first byte of that quantity. And so the computer system uh, will need to know kind of what type of data is stored at that address in order to know how many bytes of memory to read to get kind of the int that's stored there needs to read four bytes. If a double is stored there, it needs to read eight bytes. And so this is kind of one of the roles of uh, giving data types in a language like C or C++ is for the system to know kind of how to interact with the, the memory where that quantity is stored. All right, speaking of storage, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the storage hierarchy or the memory hierarchy uh, because there are a number of different places in a computer system where data is stored and they have different 
properties. And as we talk about how a database is managing uh, the data, is interacting with the different places information can be stored, it's important that we understand uh, uh, what these different things are. So our hierarchy is as follows. Uh, we have something called CPU registers at the top. Uh, CPU here stands for Central Processing Unit. Uh, it's the component of a computer system that actually executes operations. So uh, a C++ program, when we compile it, what is actually produced by that compilation pro process is a sequence of uh, instructions um, for the CPU, kind of, uh, kind of uh, operations like add two numbers together or move data from one place to another. And uh, this, this CPU, um, which is also referred to as a core or a processor or a chip, um, uh, the, the CPU has on it uh, small pieces of memory called registers. And kind of below that in our storage hierarchy, uh, we have caches. And uh, caches are larger than registers. Um, and they're in, in modern systems, there are often like multiple levels uh, of caches, but I'll just kind of label one box of this, of this caches. Uh, and uh, oh, that is not a box. Let me try that again. Below caches, we have DRAM. Uh, which uh, you, you might also have seen referred to as, as memory or main memory. Uh, this RAM, random access memory, uh, D is, is uh, dynamic. And um, uh, DRAM is kind of, uh, when, you, when people talk about how much memory a computer has, they're typically talking about uh, DRAM. Uh, an important property of these three levels so far is that they are volatile, meaning that they require electricity in order to maintain uh, the information they're storing. That when your computer shuts down, all the information in the registers and the caches and in DRAM is lost. Those, uh, they, they're not powered anymore. And so when your computer shuts down, all the currently running programs uh, that had data in, in memory, those are, those are all lost. Um, and this is, these three levels support random access, meaning that we can just like pick a point uh, anywhere in, in RAM or in cache or registers are just like a single unit of memory, but, but pick, pick a point and just kind of jump there uh, and access it, random access. And these are what are called byte addressable. Uh, and, and I already talked about this for memory, but it holds true for the other ones as well. Uh, when we have a quantity stored at one of these levels, we have um, the location of the, the actual bytes uh, of the data, whether it's a memory address for DRAM or, or kind of a register that it's in or, or, or a cache line uh, that it's in. So that's kind of our first half of the hierarchy. Below this, we have a, a, a solid state drive. Um, I'm going to make a, a division between these two sections. Uh, and this is kind of one kind of uh, storage hardware. Uh, and then we have solid state drive and hard disk drive. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's fine to just know the, the uh, abbreviations, SSD, HDD. Um, and at the lowest level here, We have network storage. So this is like stuff stored in, in the cloud, stuff that is, uh, requires a kind of connection to, to the, the internet or uh, um, uh, a connection to another, uh, another computer in the same facility, like a data center or, or on campus like Carleton, uh, but it's not stored anywhere uh, on any device like physically connected to the computer system. It's, it's over a network connection is how you would access it. 
And uh, these three are all non-volatile storage, meaning that these all are persistent, meaning that we can uh, lose uh, electricity and we keep what's on our, our, our hard drive or solid state drive or, or in cloud storage. Um, and uh, another important difference uh, of these three from here is that these support not random access, but sequential access, uh, meaning that we can't just kind of jump around to any point uh, uh, within, our, within our storage. That's kind of not how the hardware is physically set up. They're set up to kind of uh, go to a specific point and then kind of read the information sequentially from that point on. Uh, that's the sort of access that they are designed to support. Um, and rather than byte addressable, rather than kind of having the location of an individual byte uh, within these uh, these kinds of storage, uh, they are what is called uh, block addressable, meaning that uh, data on our hard drives or or on the the. Uh, storage accessible over the network is kind of chunked into these blocks and they can be uh, uh, different sizes depending on uh, the storage device but we if we say have a particular file uh, that's uh, two uh, two kilobytes like two thousand bytes um, and our blocks are four kilobytes four thousand bytes then uh, in order to like we would maintain information such as the block that our two kilobyte file is stored in and perhaps the offset from the start of the block where we can find it uh, rather than having some uh, so it kind of has this two part we we can only refer to like chunks of, of data access chunks of data on these drives kind of in these blocks and so we need to go to the block and then we know oh uh, like 1,000 uh, bytes in is where our file starts, so we need to kind of read to that point. Now we're where our file starts, and we can start uh, retrieving it from disk. And so the reason I refer to this as a hierarchy is that as we go higher in the hierarchy, the storage it becomes faster it becomes smaller and it becomes more expensive. And so uh, caches uh, are tend to be uh, extremely fast to access. They actually use a random access memory technology called SRAM uh, that, that's um, kind of more efficient than DRAM, but it is much more expensive. It requires uh, kind of more transistors, more power, uh, and so you don't want to have uh, you're not going to have a, a system or it would be very unusual to have a system where it has like eight gigabytes of SRAM uh, that would be uh, quite quite expensive whereas DRAM um, slower but we can have a lot more of it and that's kind of the um, and kind of conversely as you go down in the hierarchy uh, you get slower larger and cheaper so you can have um, uh, the, the solid state drive is more expensive uh, but faster than the hard disk drive and the, the difference between these two uh, a solid state drive as well I guess let me start with a hard disk drive hard disk uh, is uh, for a long for for many years was kind of the just the de facto storage medium and and what it consisted of was uh, a number of physical platters uh, kind of like disks that that um, had kind of data magnetically encoded on them. And the hard disk would actually have a mechanical arm that would, uh, and the disk would, would spin, and the mechanical arm uh, would read data off of the spinning disks. And so to access data um, on these disks, the, the arm had to like seek to the appropriate point on the appropriate disk and then read the data there. And so uh, this was vastly superior to the uh, a previous storage technology, magnetic tape, uh, you may have may have seen in uh, in old movies or movies made to look old, kind of big reels of uh, of some kind of like 
black strip um, that, that are attached to computers, and that's magnetic tape that is storing data. Um, and hard disk drives, big advance over that. Uh, and then solid state drives are uh, a storage technology that doesn't have these moving parts, doesn't have spinning platters, doesn't have arms that move. Uh, and so this, this sort of storage technology originally showed up in uh, kind of mo uh, mobile devices, things that were uh, like like uh, uh, iPods, um, things like things like that, where you wouldn't want some mechanical arm that was going to get knocked around. You wanted a, a storage technology that was just like a solid, uh, uh, solid um, chunk with that kind of moving parts that, that need uh, parts that needed to move in order to access. Uh, and this this made it um, that this does make it faster. Um, all right, so we have this storage hierarchy. Uh, let's actually put some numbers to uh, how accesses to this storage, uh, kind of how long different types of operations take. So um, our, like, our, our CPU registers are almost instantaneous. It's a single uh, CPU instruction uh, to, to access data in a register. Uh, a cache reference uh, is going to take, depending, as I said, there are multiple levels of caches in, in, in most kinds of systems. So uh, this is something like one to seven uh, nanoseconds. So extremely fast, um, not quite as fast as registers. Um, this is in comparison to a uh, main memory uh, reference. Uh, remember, and remember I said that, that main memory is another term for uh, this DRAM uh, point in our hierarchy, but a main memory reference uh, typically takes about 100 nanoseconds, so um, considerably slower than our cache reference, so uh, accessing data in, in, in cache uh, is, is very handy. And uh, this memory by reference, I mean kind of a, a random access, so we want to jump to a random point and like read an, an integer an integer stored there. Um, by comparison, our solid state drive random read, um, which as you, you may remember is, is not what this uh, these storage devices are sort of uh, set up to do, but if we just kind of need to, to get to a random point, uh, that's something like 150,000 nanoseconds. So, um, more than uh, uh, more than a thousand times as as slow as our main memory reference, uh, and so when we're say executing a query in a database, we need the data that we're processing to be in memory as opposed to sitting on a, a solid state drive or, or or a hard disk drive, um, uh, and so. That, that's why we need something like a buffer pool manager uh, to, to manage how data is, is transferred and, and, uh, between memory and, and disk. Uh, all right, so we have our SSD random read. Um, and if we want to read one megabyte, which is uh, one million bytes, or uh, two to the 20th bytes, which is about a million, um, uh, if we want to read one million bytes uh, sequentially from memory, so from our DRAM, uh, that DRAM uh, much better for random access that is, than it is uh, for sequential uh, reads, at least in comparison to other places in, in the hierarchy. So our, our reading one megabyte sequentially uh, from memory uh, is... 250,000 nanoseconds. Um, uh, so one megabyte, it's, it's uh, uh, certainly a decent amount of, of, uh, uh, of memory. And, but we had a hundred, more than a hundred, uh, more than a thousand times slower for the random read. Uh, but when we're talking about um, one megabyte sequentially, on our solid state drive, uh, that's actually only four times slower uh, than our one megabyte sequentially from memory. So when it comes to this sequential access, uh, our, our, no, 
non-volatile storage uh, looks pretty good. Uh, and so this would put it at uh, a million uh, nanoseconds, which I'm just going to switch over to um, milliseconds. So this is one uh, millisecond for our one megabyte sequential read. And uh, our hard disk drive, uh, considerably slower than all of these, uh, our hard disk drive uh, seek. So as I was talking about like a mechanical uh, arm seeking to where it should start reading in these uh, is uh, 10 uh, milliseconds. So uh, sort of seek is to like get to the, the point where it could randomly read. So that's 10 milliseconds versus 0.15. Uh, uh, milliseconds for uh, for our SSD. So SSD is a, a considerably faster storage technology. Um, and then our hard disk drive, uh, one megabyte read uh, sequentially uh, is going to be about 20 milliseconds. Uh, and so the take what I want you to take away from uh, uh, from this kind of discussion of the storage hierarchy is one, uh, reading and writing to uh, disk to the kind of persistent storage uh, on the system is very expensive. It, it takes quite a bit of time uh, in comparison to other kind of memory operations that we might be doing. Uh, and so we want to carefully manage that to avoid our, our programs sort of stalling out as they wait for some, uh, some operation on, on disk to finish. Um, and the second takeaway is that uh, our random access on, on disk is kind of much worse relatively than the sequential access to disk. That uh, if we can, uh, if our database system can um, maximize the amount of sequential reading or writing that it's doing rather than needing to jump all over the place, it's going to get kind of the most performance it can get out of these disk operations. All right. There is kind of one more part of the memory hierarchy that I'd like to say more about, and this is the, the caching piece, and pretty just sort of the general concept of a cache. Uh, and so caches generally operate, um, or I should say caches, the, the purpose of them is to store data that a program is currently working with. Uh, they're much faster to access than memory. And so if uh, the variable whose value we need to get is in a cache versus in memory, we're going to save a lot of time. And so the idea is, well, the, the, the variables, the, 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 the data that we need right now, we'll keep in cache. Um, caches are, are maybe much too small to store all of the data our program will ever use. Uh, and so we'll just keep the kind of working set, the data that we need right now uh, in the cache and swap it out uh, and, and replace it with, with new data as we go. And this often results in good performance because of locality, meaning that when we access a, a, a particular piece of data, uh, it is likely that we will access that same data or data that's nearby in memory uh, again soon. Think of uh, looping over an array. We have a, a loop variable, um, like an array index that we're accessing over and over, we're, we're reading the value, we're incrementing it by one, uh, and so we want that in, in our cache, say, and even though we're not going, say, uh, we're not accessing the exact same array element each time, we're, we're going through the array in order. So we're accessing the element uh, at one point in memory, and then the element right next to it, and then the element right next to it. So if we bring, a whole, if we bring the whole array, uh, or a big chunk of the array, into our cache, we'll get a whole bunch of, uh, of accesses um, to the cache in a row. And uh, this is kind of the, the uh, this idea kind of goes throughout our entire um, storage hierarchy, where each level in our hierarchy is kind of transferring data to and from uh, the level below it and the level above it. And kind of each level can act as a cache for the level below it, meaning that each level can be holding the, the, the most uh, salient or, or, or relevant data to the current operations from the level below in order to speed up the operations we're currently doing. Um, as I said, 
because our faster storage is more expensive, our system's just not going to have enough of it to store all the, the data that we were currently working with. Um, and there's an important concept where all right, our cache is full, and we want to bring in more data from memory because we, we need to, to access it. But our cache, all like one megabyte or, or 128 kilobytes or 16 kilobytes, whatever it is, it's all full. And so we need to check, uh, we need to uh, identify some piece of data that's currently in the cache that we can kick out, that we can evict uh, in order to make room for the new data we, we need to bring in. Um, and deciding what data uh, to evict from a cache um, is kind of a whole, uh, a whole kind of s s subject of, uh, of research and computer science on its own. Uh, but one, uh, one important idea is least recently used. That if we're, if we're going to uh, kick out some piece of data from our cache to, to make room, uh, maybe the, thing, the, the data that was accessed least recently uh, we're going to say, well, we're not likely to access that again. It's been it's been ages since we used these uh, uh, the, the, this variable or this object. Um, we're just going to say uh, that's the least recently used, and we'll we'll evict that from the cache in order to to make room. Uh, and this least recently used is often um, abbreviated LRU. And so an LRU uh, replacement policy or LRU eviction policy uh, is is pretty common in terms of uh, deciding these things about a cache, and the buffer pool manager that you will implement will, you will also implement a kind of simple LRU, um, uh, LRU kind of replacer uh, uh, class that will, will, op uh, will operate on this principle. Okay. That is it for the storage hierarchy and kind of the next fundamental of computer systems uh, that I want to talk about is the operating system. Now, the operating system is the piece of software on a computer system uh, that sits between the underlying hardware, the physical devices, and user applications. So any program that's running on a computer system has to go through the operating system in order to uh, have access to the underlying hardware. Now, uh, what uh, uh, and, and examples of, of operating systems, uh, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, these, these are all operating systems. Um, and the why does the, the user um, uh, have to go through the operating system uh, to access the hardware? Well, uh, one is uh, we don't trust the user app. Uh, it, it, might, it might be very, very mean or bad or just extremely incompetent. Um, and so we don't want uh, some, some malicious or, or destructive application um, erasing all the data on, on our hard drive or taking over uh, the, the, uh, the screen of our uh, computer and just um, not letting any other application use it or consuming all the memory on our system and, and uh, no, no, no other application can, uh, can allocate memory. So for that reason, we have the operating system sitting here coordinating um, the access to all these sort of shared resources, right? All the user applications, they're sharing uh, uh, the... Uh, they're, they're, they're sharing the, the hard disk, they're sharing the screen, they're sharing memory. And so we need some, uh, some kind of uh, component of our computer system that's going to coordinate all this, all this access. Um, and so because we don't trust user applications, our operating system provides what are called system calls, which are, uh, they're just functions, procedures, uh, that user applications can uh, invoke, can call, in order to ask the OS to do a specific task. So uh, another thing of this is as, as an API that the operating system offers to user applications. And so, uh, for example, um, Linux has uh, 
the uh, read system call. And this is uh, uh, something that, that an application would call in order to uh, read information from a file. And so this is what Linux provides. And then the C uh, standard library uh, provides a function called fread, uh, which often is often uh, implemented in, in terms of, of read on Linux. Uh, and so fread is like what a C program would call, um, and then uh, the, the, the library function would call the, the system call. Uh, and then C++, being object-oriented, uh, provides uh, an fstream uh, class. But again, this is still kind of all built on top of the, the functionality the operating system offers because uh, user applications are not allowed to just uh, uh, read and write files uh, willy-nilly. And a similar kind of principle applies or, or relationship applies when it comes to allocating memory. As I said, the, the operating system is managing this. It's kind of uh, uh, allowing applications to kind of all share uh, the, the memory available in the computer system without uh, getting in each other's way, overwriting, and they're also protected from each other. Um, and so when, when user applications dynamically allocate memory, um, such as creating a data structure for a matrix whose size is not known at compile time, right? And in Project Zero, you're implementing a, 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 a matrix class that kind of takes in a number of rows and columns. Um, and so when that program is compiled, uh, it's not necessarily known ahead of time, uh, or when that class is, is written and compiled, it's not known ahead of time exactly, like rows and columns could be, could be different for different matrices, et cetera. And so, uh, there needs to be code inside that class to um, ask the operating system for the memory it needs to store the particular dimensions of, of the matrix, um, rather than say the alternative is, oh, well, we'll just set a maximum size and always kind of allocate a matrix that big, um, definite downsides to, to something like that. And so uh, in, in C++, uh, we have the new operator, um, which we use to, to ask, uh, to to allocate uh, new new memory for, for an object or an array or, or something like that. Um, C has the malloc function, uh, memory allocation function, uh, and this says, uh, all right, here's how many bytes of memory my program uh, uh, I want you to give me, and the oper operating system hands back a memory address where those bytes are located in the computer's memory. Um, and both of these, uh, uh, kind of the, the Linux uh, uh, system call uh, is something called sbreak, which uh, kind of change, adjusts how much memory a particular program has access to. And kind of each of these, uh, uh, for C and C++, we're also, um, are the, the programs are also responsible for telling uh, telling the system when they are done with a particular piece of memory, when it can be reused by someone else. Uh, and in C++, uh, that's delete. Uh, in uh, C, that's the free function. Um, and so I, I kind of bring up this, this memory piece first to, to introduce kind of these terms of malloc and, and free, since uh, as uh, in, uh, in kind of discussions of computer systems, uh, well, I'm talking about kind of mallocking uh, a chunk of memory, and so that, that's where that's coming from, a, a function that C provides to ask for uh, a particular piece of memory. Um, but something a database system often needs to do uh, is to load the contents of a file on disk into memory. Um, and remember our storage hierarchy, memory, a lot faster than disk, so we're often going to want to kind of load files into memory that we, that we currently need. Um, and so uh, the, the, disk is, uh, the, the database system is going to, um, the, uh, databases are often going to have more, uh, more data than can fit in memory at one time. And so the database system is going to need to have some way of moving chunks of, of data from disk to memory when they're needed and then out of memory back to disk uh, when we don't need them anymore or when we need to make room for something else uh, in order to be able to work with all the data in the database since we can't have all of it in memory at once. 
And so uh, our database management system um, moves pages to and from disk and memory. And uh, in particular, this term of pages is sort of just the, the terminology for these chunks of memory that are getting moved between, uh, uh, between main memory and, uh, and disk is, is uh, uh, these, these fixed size pages. And so this is, this, uh, this is what the buffer pool manager is doing. It is coordinating uh, how pages get moved to and from disk. And so this is the piece that, that you will be implementing. All right, so that's uh, what, what I have to say about kind of brief bit about operating system and how that sort of fits into what the, the database system is doing. And the last piece is going to be a concurrency, which I, I promised at the, at the beginning. And so our uh, concurrency is around this idea of threads. And uh, a thread is a single unit of execution. Meaning that um, kind of when there's, uh, uh, when the, the computer system is running programs, uh, a thread is like a, a kind of single sequence of, uh, of operations or, or instructions that are going to get executed. Um, and it also uh, represents kind of the, the minimal unit that the computer will, will schedule or run. So uh, a, a computer system will, will be running kind of one or more threads at a time, and a thread is like a, a, a sequence of operations. And so, um, Many of the, the programs that you will have written will be single threaded. There is they they kind of there's there's not kind of multiple things that are happening simultaneously. There's just kind of a, a single thread of execution. But we can also have multi-threaded uh, uh, programs, um, and there are some reasons that we might want to do this. Uh, having multiple threads uh, can be helpful for for program structure. So uh, if we are and a program involves logically distinct tasks, such as um, drawing the user interface, or handling uh, user input, or retrieving data from, uh, from the network. Uh, these are all kind of logically distinct tasks that we might uh, implement as, as separate threads. So there's like, uh, within our application, there's kind of one thread that's handling user input, and another thread that's uh, sending and receiving data from the network. Um, and because they're kind of doing these distinct tests, it's useful to, to have them kind of as these separate threads of execution. Um, as a sort of related application, we might want threads for responsiveness. Um, uh, if we have, uh, say, a long-running op operation like uh, uh, writing a file out to disk um, or, or uh, downloading so, some large file or something like that, something that's going to take a while. Uh, we, we probably want to shift that work into the background and have the system still be responsive. So uh, uh, Chrome uh, uh, or, or other web browsers, uh, you can still interact with them while they're downloading a file. Right? They, they, have, they have kind of one thread that's downloading the file, um, but other threads that are handling the user input and, and interface and so on so that they can uh, stay, re stay responsive. Uh, and, and it's kind of similar, any of these long running background tasks, good use for threads. Um, and then there are some kind of, uh, there are performance benefits that uh, if our computer system has a multiple uh, CPUs, um, multiple processors, meaning that kind of each of these processors can be uh, executing the, the operations for a, a single thread at a given moment, well then having multiple threads lets us actually uh, literally do multiple things simultaneously by having each thread uh, running on a, on a separate CPU. So that's sort of the motivation for um, concurrency, which is uh, the situation when we have um, uh, multiple uh, 
uh, multiple threads. sharing resources. So uh, if we have multiple threads trying to, to access the same, the same resource um, or the same data, uh, this is uh, where concurrency comes into play. Uh, and um, we, we will need strategies for or tools to coordinate uh, the access to these shared resources. Um, so I want to illustrate kind of why this is actually something that we need to care about. So um, we're going to imagine uh, that uh, we have uh, two threads, thread A, thread B. We have thread A and thread B. And what thread A wants to do uh, is to uh, subtract $200 from my account. And what thread B wants to do, which I like a lot better, is to add $100 to my account. And so uh, these are our kind of two tasks. We have them happening in separate threads. Uh, and I want to show that uh, Having these in separate threads raises the possibility of kind of serious problems, even absent multiple cores, even absent multiple CPUs. Having these kind of both these threads happening at the same time uh, makes the code the code vulnerable. So what we uh, let's say that um, the current balance of my account is $500. And so what we would expect if these both, uh, after both these operations uh, complete, is for my account to have $400 left. And uh, to make uh, what these are doing kind of more code-like, I want to break it down uh, into kind of these actually involve three different steps. Um, these both need to uh, read the current balance and then thread A is going to subtract 200, thread B is going to add 100, and then the third step is going to be to update the balance with the new total. And the vulnerability of this code comes from the fact that when we have multiple threads, uh, they can, the steps that they're executing can be interleaved, can be kind of, can happen in any order. Um, or, or rather that they, they each of the each individual threads operations will happen in the order I have them here, but kind of between them, they can be kind of mixed together in any way. And so um, these are what are called uh, interleaving. So we have interleaving one. Um, it's uh, it's. It's uh, the situation where kind of all of thread A happens before all of thread B. So uh, we have A and B, and so A does read minus 200 and update, and B, after A is finished, does its read plus 100 and update. And all is well. We end up with $400 in my account as expected. But because the computer system is free to kind of switch between the two currently running threads uh, kind of at any point, um, it's possible to get a different interleaving. And so here we again have a 
at B, and let's say A reads the current balance, then B reads the current balance, then A, then we switch back to A, it subtracts, we switch back to B, it adds, and then A does its update, and then B does its update. And so in this situation, A reads that I have $500, B reads that I have $500. And so A subtracts 200, says, all right, the balance should be 300. B adds $100 to the 500 red, say, all right, new balance is 600. A overwrites the balance with 300, and then B overwrites that with 600, and we end up with $600 in my account. Yay, bank error in my favor. You know, maybe these interleavings aren't quite so bad. Uh, but we do have to consider, say, a, another interleaving where uh, we switch the order of these updates. So we have, again, A reads, B reads, A minus 200, B plus 100, then B does its update. And then the last thing to happen is A's update. And so the final value in the account is $300. I'm very sad. This concurrency is a huge problem, and we, we must fix it immediately. So I hope that this convinces you that when we have multiple threads running, they're going to have individual steps that they're doing. And if they are sharing some data, in this case, the balance in my bank account, it's possible without any sort of constraints on them that their instructions will interleave such that uh, some operation that they're doing gets lost or overwritten. Uh, and so we want to write computer programs that are uh, thread safe, meaning that they will be correct in the presence of any, uh, 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 that they will be correct in the presence of, of interleavings, meaning that, and in particular, this will often mean making it impossible for there to be these kind of bad interleavings that lose, lose an update. And so how we, uh, the, the, the main tool that we're going to use uh, in order to, to deal with these bad interleavings and basically uh, enforce it to either be this interleaving one or the reverse, that B is either going to, that, that B is going to happen all at once and that A is going to happen all at once and that they're not going to get kind of interleaved together. And yeah, maybe B will happen first, but as long as they all, they happen in these sort of atomic chunks, um, then we're going to, to get the, the correct result. So we're going, we're going to want synchronization, some tool to synchronize our two threads to have them coordinate access to this shared data, um, this, this current balance, since they're both reading and writing. Uh, and so we're going to uh, use synchronization and identify the part of our program where we only want one thread running it at a time. And this is um, called a critical section. So We, we want to, to know the critical section of our code, which is the uh, region of code where only one thread should run at a time. And what we um, what we can do uh, is use, uh, use something called a mutex, which is sort for um, mutual exclusion, mutex for short. Uh, and this, will, uh, this is a, going to be an object. Uh, and mutex is actually something that, that C++ provides. So, uh, in particular, we have standard mutex. And what we can do is we have a lock method on the mutex that is going to uh, say um, either acquire 
the mutex or wait if it has already been locked, already been acquired by some other thread. Uh, and then we have a corresponding uh, unlock. And so if we modify our, uh, our threads here uh, to first lock and then at the end unlock, What this will do is that whichever thread gets to its first operation first, it will lock our mutex and then do its update to the bank account. And then if the other thread, when the other thread gets to run and gets to trying to lock, it will say, oh, this, lock hit, this mutex has already been acquired and it's going to wait um, until that mutex becomes unlocked. And so uh, as, as long as these two threads are, are sharing this mutex, we can use it to uh, synchronize or control at concurrent access to our shared data. Uh, and so in the, the projects for, um, for one and, and beyond, uh, you'll be making use of mutexes uh, in order to uh, coordinate um, uh, access to, to data and keep it thread safe. All right, so that concludes this kind of um, uh, blitz through uh, the uh, kind of some fundamentals of computer systems. Uh, and I hope that this is going to kind of set us up for kind of a, having a, a common base of, of terminology and, and knowledge as far as this stuff goes. So as I said, the, uh, the uh, buffer pool uh, lecture from Andy Pavlo is linked in, in the description uh, along with um, information kind of the uh, which is the kind of key relevant part and then there's a lot of other stuff in in the lecture about potential optimizations that won't be part of project one but are kind of interesting and, and relevant to real uh, database systems so uh, go ahead and, and check that out uh, and I look forward to your questions uh, about this and and everything else that I, I've talked about here wait what what is happening oh oh this feels weird oh I, I think I'm gonna be sick <laughs>